As some of you know, I live in the woods. My home has five acres of trees, and this fall we planted more. This time there are trees that will produce fruit and nuts. We had to take down two centuries-old oak trees a few years ago, so this planting of another 24 trees was in part my returning back to the land what we took. It's also part of my plan to live sustainably, to be in relationship with a tiny portion of this planet in such a way that we can mutually feed and care for each other. It'll be years before we're laden with apples and pecans, but, far, but part of living with the trees is really learning to be patient, to let life unfold slowly. In a lot of ways, living closer to church would make my life easier. I truly hate commuting. And I think community church should be embedded in a neighborhood, that ministers should live in a community. I'm grateful to Brother Zachary and his family that they are willing to do that, which lets me, at least for now, live among the trees. (laughs) Those trees and I are in relationship. We've been watching each other age for 22 years. I've become very sensitive to their rhythms. One of the things I watch for is the acorn crop. When the acorn crop is heavy, we have to be very careful about where we park because acorns, when they drop dozens of feet, have the power to dent metal and break glass. Some years we actually sit on the deck and we just listen to them dropping all around us. We even put up umbrellas sometimes to protect ourselves. But some years there are hardly any acorns at all, leaving us in peace, but distressing the squirrels who depend on them through those long winters. So it's interesting to me that those large or small crops seem to be simultaneous all over my property, even the neighborhood. I've since learned that they're countywide, even statewide, Some years there are lots of acorns and hazelnuts and pecans, and some years very few. I used to think that a particular tree just got more or less sun or had attracted some more delicious bugs, bringing in more woodpeckers, causing distress. But the idea that all the trees are in the same rhythm goes a little against my own sense of trees as individual beings. Scientists and now some theologians have also observed this pattern. Robin Wall Kimmer is both. She's a botanist with a PhD. She teaches at Syracuse University. She's also of indigenous ancestry coming from the nation of Potawatomi. Her landmark book, Braiding Sweetgrass, is a reflection on life using both lenses. So I listened to chapters. Have you read this book, Braiding Sweetgrass? Has anyone listened to it? I started listening to it on Audible, and I I listen to it sometimes on my way into work during that commute (laughs) when I drive in on Sundays, because just listening to it can feel like a blessing. One of the things I learned from her and have since looked into even more is that deep underground, far beneath us, is a network of life we call mycelium. There's a massive growth, a connection of fungi, almost entirely unseen, but without which life on earth does not thrive. This network connects the trees, each to the other, making them not entirely individual, but deeply rooted, bonded in ways that promote life and health. The trees are connected underground through subterranean network of fungal strands that inhabit tree roots and are linked each to the other. The fungi forage for mineral nutrients in the soil and deliver them to the trees in exchange for carbohydrates. They form bridges between individual trees so that the forest, which looks to us, like it's crowded by standalone beings, 
is in fact thick with connection, moving carbohydrates from tree to tree. Kimmer calls it a kind of Robin Hood, taking from the rich and giving to the poor, so all the trees arrive at the same carbon surplus at the same time. It's a web of reciprocity, of giving and taking. Adrienne Marie Brown uses this insight to talk about human resilience, offering insight to how we can organize ourselves. Most organizing work, most of the work of building equitable systems, of creating a just, vibrant, healthy society happens beneath the surface. Like the millions of miles of fungal threads constantly reaching out in systems of reciprocity, the world we dream about is being sustained deep beneath the soil. There are some of us who pop up from time to time with things to say, mushrooms of protests and rallies, but much of the work to get us there and to heal us afterwards happens underground. And these underground systems bind and connect us. The soil is stronger because of the mycelium, and our communities are stronger because of our relationships, because of the relationships we intentionally build with each other, mile deep and mile wide creating an alternative to many human communities that are no more than inch deep or inch wide. Resilient communities, mycelium, human and otherwise, work by absorbing impact all along the network, not stressing any one part, by diffusing toxins reducing potential harm, and sending out warnings when possible mischief is headed our way. And mycelium transform death into life. They recycle, upcycle, convert the elements of a body no longer used to the next body, breaking down bones into minerals and dispersing the food to promote life through the forest and beyond. This is a model for living, for building this world we dream about, deeply connected, intertwined, mutually dependent, wide and deep and earthbound in a network of necessary partnerships, collaboratives, and interrelationships. You have heard me say we are in an epidemic of loneliness. There are many reasons for this. Families have moved further from each other. People have moved from their birthplaces. Communal events have moved online, keeping us at a distance. No longer being together, we watch each other. It's also true that our economic system has allowed, even inspired, a centralization and necessity of money made worse by the enormous expense of everyday living, forcing people to work longer hours, hold more than one job, and cut back on social gatherings they can no longer afford. And while the integration of Zoom into our social fabric has many advantages, one of those advantages is also working against us when we can say yes to so many things and often want to try to make more connections and then find ourselves stretched too thin and living in a constant state of overwhelm with so many relationships no more than screen deep. And sometimes there's shame in being lonely in having no one who wants to prioritize you on a holiday or thinks to invite you to a weeknight dinner or a gallery opening. That shame can lead to silence, exacerbating the experience of being lonely. And it's everywhere. It's a national epidemic. 
An old friend noted the other day that she had no one to invite to her Seder this year because her daughter is so adamantly pro-Palestine and her in-laws are equally passionate about supporting Israel. So even those who might have access to family are finding the temperature of the moment too hot for comfort, keeping us ever more divided. Like the trees, though, we don't survive on our own. We certainly don't thrive. Years of COVID fear and lockdown taught us that in a hurry, we have yet to recover from our sudden radical disconnection from each other. And I think the healing wisdom comes to us from the trees. So don't laugh at me, but I read some advice columns. I, I read them from the New York Times. I read them from Washington Post. I'm very curious about what everyone thinks everyone else should be doing with their lives. But in one of them, a writer said that they were lonely and asked for ideas, to which the response was something like, join restaurant groups and go on museum tours, which is completely and totally unhelpful. I mean, it's hard to believe the person hadn't already thought of those things. But more important, showing up isn't really a solution to the profound disconnection people are experiencing. Those are, to repeat the phrase, inch deep. So I think of the mycelium, deep below the surface, living in the roots of the trees, stretching across the vastness of Earth, intertwining threaded arms with other threaded arms in every direction, moving energy back and forth, feeding and being fed in a network of slow-moving, life-giving exchange. That's so different from watching a protest from Facebook Live or commenting on a comment on Substack or following a YouTuber or participating in a Zoom retreat. Mycelium get dirty. They stay put. They are in constant communication. They are in necessary relationship. I wonder if we can do that too. For myself, I have decided to try. Now, I'm going to admit to you that I am exhausted. Anyone in my vicinity these past few weeks knows I am exhausted. I'm a little short-tempered. I'm a little less patient, a little less able to focus on things, if only because there are just too many of them. And that's a problem. There are too many things. I need some time off, I suspect, maybe a weekend of quiet. But that's a quick fix. The problem is deeper, and I know that I am not alone in it. There are too many things. Sometimes these things are life-giving, and I want more of them. But often they're depleting, usually because they're online, which feels flat and energyless. And I leave with less life, less, less strength detached and alone. I'm not someone who feels lonely from too few people, actually, but I can feel it from too many people. Too many shallow relationships, too few deep ones, too much living on the surface, mile wide, inch deep. So in my own case, I'm gonna start letting go of things. And you wanna know where this is most difficult? where the things are ego-feeding, but not life-giving. You know the difference? Do you have that in your life? Right? Chairing national boards, sitting on committees at the invitation of someone important. I have a very long list of things that feed ego, but not soul, and I'm letting them go. Because the world is not better when we're exhausted. Exhausted trees produce no fruit or nuts. I find life in a few places, and I'm going to sink into those. With the time I save letting go of ego work, I'm going to be more present to that which is soul feeding. Right? I'm in a book club with friends, both old and new. I'm going to read all those books. You know how often I show up for book club going, I'm sorry, I didn't read the book again this week. I'm going to read the books. 
I'm going to arrive early and leave late. I'm not going to run in at the last possible minute and then say I really need to go. I'm going to enjoy kitchen conversations and side talk. I'm going to invite more people to my home for a dinner, something I used to do frequently but stop because I'm too busy. I'm going to say yes to invitations and set dates sooner rather than later. But I so often do. Do you do this? I say yes and I push it off. It's like six months from now because I've got all these busy things I've got to do. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to say yes. Are you free right now? I'm going to learn from the mycelium to move in many directions, making direct contact, feeling those I can touch. And I wonder about you too. How can you live a more entangled life? How can you go deep and get dirty? Can you move beneath the surface and reach out to find others also subterranean, who are looking to make connections, to attach to roots and branches, to move out with threaded arms in many directions? Can you find food and offer food and live in a system of reciprocity? I'm worried, I know many of you are too, about what's next for this country and even in this city. There is no question for me that our healing, our hope, lies in relationships. Our ability to connect meaningfully, to gift each other by seeing each other, and accept the gift of others seeing us. Weaving ourselves to each other, committing ourselves to our common purpose, linking our arms, creating a network of mutuality, and holding on tightly when trouble comes our way, absorbing it by spreading out the impact, protecting each other with our commitment to interdependence. Hope is in the acceptance of our profound, beautiful, life-giving, so deep as to be subterranean, essential, independent, multi-dimensional, entangled life. you're moving through a storm Drifting on the sea Wondering where you belong See you going round in summer wind You're wishing that the world would stop and let your life begin If you find yourself too far away And you feel like hope is gone Tie yourself to me And I will lead you home Tie yourself to me If you think you're gonna drown Tie yourself Yourself to me. 